here today, but he's keenly following these proceedings and, he's, and has wished us uh, the best of luck with uh, this event this evening. This Asmal lecture was established uh, following Carter's untimely passing in 2011 uh, to honor the legacy that he has left us with, but also to pursue that legacy. Carter, as you all know, questioning democracy. The very first lecture in the series was held in 2013 and was delivered by his close friend and collaborator, um, Justice Albie Sachs. And I'm sure many of you will have heard the story of the two of them sitting down in Carter's kitchen in, in Dublin to be begin drafting what became our Bill of Rights. That lecture was held, as I say, in 2013 at the University of the Western Cape, which was Carter's South African academic home. This is not just an annual lecture, but we have coupled it with a scholarship program um, where we provide a South African scholar with an opportunity to study for a master's in law at Trinity College Dublin, a master's in international humanitarian law, and Trinity being Carter's main academic home where he spent more than a quarter of a century at Trinity College, including a stint as the dean of the law faculty there. And on a day such as this, when we honor the memory of Carter, he would have been extremely delighted with the performance of the Irish cricket team at Lords today, having bowled England out for a paltry 85 runs. Those of you who knew Carter will know that he was a very keen um, cricket fan and an avid follower of the game, so he will be smiling wherever he is, and I'm sure raising a glass of Ireland's finest as well. This evening, we're indebted to the hospitali hospitality of ENS Africa as our hosts, and I would like to ask the chairman of ENS, Professor Michael Katz, to give us a few wo uh, words of welcome. Michael. Thanks, Lawson. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As uh, Lawson said, um, He's asked me just to welcome the guests on behalf of ENS Africa, so welcome. When Lawson asked me uh, if we would host it, I readily agreed. I was delighted to be asked for a variety of reasons. Firstly, I knew Carter well and had many interactions with him. And as Lawson said, he was an avid cricket fan and we used to exchange anecdotes, and we also discussed legal issues. But in all our exchanges, my role was predominantly the listener. Um, then I had great admiration for Carter. When he was Minister of Water Affairs, I don't think we had a drought in South Africa, certainly not in Cape Town. <laughs> so he did a good job. Second reason, well, I was so happy to do it tonight, is in admiration for Cassack and Lawson, the absolute fundamental role they've played in upholding the rule of law and in fighting corruption. And we really are indebted to them, as also the various other organizations who have done the same, Section 27, Judge Crickler, I'm happy to Welcome particularly tonight, um, Corruption Watch, David Lewis, happy to welcome particularly the Helen Sussman Foundation and uh, the various um, institutions that have played such a fundamental role. The third reason was in recognition and in respect for our guest speaker tonight, Advocate Batoy has taken on a monumental role. She's going to tell you what it entails, but we certainly are placing a lot of uh, trust that she will discharge this role in taking South Africa to um, a very important journey to a better South Africa. 
Um, just one issue I may, and I asked her if I could tell the story. She said yes. So now I have license. I was telling uh, Advocate Vitoy um, how enthusiastic people were to respond to the invitation to this um, um, function where she is the guest speaker. And I told Lawson and Advocate Petroy that there is a story told of a world famous crockery dealer who came to London and was walking around one Sunday morning and he saw a mangy kitten lapping milk out of a priceless Royal Dalton saucer in front of a greengrocer store. So he went to the greengrocer and said, I see that gorgeous kitten of yours. My daughter, eight-year-old daughter, just lost a kitten, was run over. She's pining, and I really need to replace that kitten. It would be a great gesture if I could buy this from you. Greengrocer, absolutely not. Long bargaining process. Eventually, this mangy kitten changes hands at an astronomical price. Now the uh, crockery dealer says, I've paid you a significant amount, I'm sure you'll agree, but I want to take home a happy kitten. I see the kitten is attached to that saucer. I think it would be right that I took the saucer with. Greengrocer says, no, you bought the kitten, not the saucer. Long discussion, the greengrocer says, not a chance. Through that saucer, I've sold 60 cats. <laughs> So I was telling the uh, advocate Petoy, she's tonight's saucer. <laughs> so, thanks for coming. We're privileged to have you. You have our full support. And I know Vizzy will introduce you shortly. Thank you, Michael. Um, as you know, Carter was one of the catalysts and the protagonists behind the establishment of CASAC uh, in 2010. I think him and others that were around him had the foresight to anticipate the challenges that would come our way, the attacks on the foundations of our democracy, uh, as well as the promotion of the principle of simple majoritarianism to neg negate the supremacy of the Constitution and respect for the rule of law. As one former president said, we who are in the majority enjoy more rights than those that are in the minority. Now we hear similar issues under the rhetoric of radical economic transformation and white monopoly capital. But as CASAC, we have a firm belief in the notion of progressive constitutionalism, that the Constitution is not a static document just to be defended, but a vibrant, living exposition of our nation's dreams and aspirations. But this constitution must be given meaning, content, and purpose. And we therefore believe that the constitution is a fundamentally transformative document that when properly used can change the lives of ordinary people and realize the vision in the preamble of our constitution. As our strapline says, and we speak of pursuing rights in order to secure human dignity. In the many challenges that we have faced, CASAC has focused on institutions of governance, including the National Prosecuting Authority. And Michael has referred to uh, many of the uh, civil society organizations that are represented in the room here this evening. And those organize, organizations that are here, we've been working together to find out how and what role we as civil society can play to strengthen the uh, NPA, to protect its independence from those who will continue to seek to try and undermine it. Given the events in our country over the last few years, I've often had cause to ask myself, what would Carter say or do when certain events take place? Now, that, those of you that know Carter will know that that's a very dangerous thing to do because no one could ever be certain of what Carter would say or do. But what I think we do know is that whatever he did or said would be in pursuance of a principled approach 
that was inherently just and fair and true to the dictates of the Constitution. As Kassak, we're very grateful for the support of the Irish Embassy in South Africa for making this, the scholarship award that we've put together a reality. For the Irish Embassy, it forms part of their broader Carter Asmal Fellowship Program with which they work with the South African government, the Department of Higher Education and Training, and others. And I'm now going to call upon the Irish Ambassador, who's going to be leaving us very soon after five years uh, a tour of service in, in South and Southern Africa. Uh, but uh, Ambassador Liam McGavin has become a great friend of South Africa, a great friend of CASAC, and I call upon the Ambassador to say a few words. Thanks very much, Lawson, and thanks for the information about the cricket. I hadn't heard about that, which is very good news. It's actually been a, a few nice days for sport in Ireland. We had an Irish winner of the, should I call it the British Open, or the Open, uh, on Sunday. Uh, but to, to hear the result in the cricket today, even though it's only the first day, is, is very nice to hear. Good evening, everybody. What a, a fantastic attendance. Lots of faces I recognize uh, or, uh, that I met over the last five years. It's really a fantastic pleasure for me uh, and privilege for me to be asked to say just a few words on the occasion of the Kader Asmal Human Rights Lecture hosted by CASEC. For us, it's really important to recognize the legacy for both Ireland and South Africa that Kader Asmal left behind. <clears throat> Kader made a huge contribution to the advancement of human rights in Ireland, north and south. He was a professor of law for 27 years in Trinity College in Dublin, specializing in human rights, international law, and labor law. And you might be interested to know that the provost of Trinity College, which is the vice chancellor in your system, is actually in South Africa at the moment. And he'll be lecturing in the University, University of Pretoria tomorrow, uh, and the University of Cape Town, and Stellenbosch uh, on Friday. Uh, and he's leaving then the weekend. But this is testament to the institutional linkages that we are now trying to establish between Irish universities and South African third level institutions, which we have started to try and do in the last few years and we're having great success on developing those linkages in the last uh, 12 months. Kader played a significant role in the founding of the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland and was one of the founders of the Irish Council for Civil Liberties in 1976. He was best known for founding the Irish anti-apartheid movement in 1964. He and his wife Louise were at the heart of the struggle against apartheid in Ireland. They garnered support from across the political spectrum and beyond. It was often a struggle managed out of the Asma household and underpinned by dedicated volunteers. We had a wonderful occasion last year in July last year when the Nelson Mandela exhibition was launched in the iconic Kil Kilmainham Jail in Dublin, when many who were part of that Irish anti-apartheid movement came together with Louise and the great friend of the Asmal family, Trevor Manuel, and our own President Higgins. And I, it was a, such an enjoyable evening listening to the many memories that these old uh, anti-apartheid activists were sharing that evening. Among them were the old Dunstore strikers. I don't know whether any of you would know about the Dunstore strikers who took action in the 1980s against products being exported from South Africa and lost their jobs over it. And they got incredible support from the Irish people uh, on that strike. So many memories were shared that evening and it was a joy to listen to them. Many of you hopefully will recall the visit by our own Head of State, President Higgins, in November 2014. President Higgins was a good friend of Kader and Louise from the days of the anti-apartheid movement in Ireland. The President, during his visit, underscored his admiration for the Constitution of South Africa and the manner in which it embraces the rights of the people of this country. This was a recurring theme during the visit, including when he had the opportunity to visit the Constitutional Court and meet with the Chief Justice and other Justices of the Court. I think he could have spent his whole visit in that one place. He was so taken by the atmosphere, by the, the way in which it was built using the bricks of the old prison, the art that's in the building, 
he was really struck by the values-based approach that is not just in the Constitution, but the whole structure and the setup within that building. Uh, he still talks about that. I met him last year and he was talking about it even then. So that was really the highlight of the visit for him. We in Ireland are especially proud that Cadder, with Albie Sachs, as Lawson has said, who went on to become a justice of the Constitutional Court, drafted the Bill of Rights in the kitchen of his home in Fox Rock, Dublin in 1988. We've argued whether that was the final draft or was just a draft of a draft. So we've come to now accept that it was just a draft and the draft was sent then to, I think, Nelson Mandela in Robben Island to finalize. So we now accept that. So that was a subsequently incorporated into the new South African Constitution and the Bill of Rights was a truly seminal document and was an essential element in the transition to democracy and the drafting of a new constitution. He, of course, was not finished there, and on returning home to South Africa, he became Minister for Water Affairs in South Africa's first democratic government, and later Minister for Education. <clears throat> His immense contribution to both South Africa and Ireland made him an obvious choice to honour when the embassy was preparing to introduce a new scholarship programme as part of the Irish government's programme of development assistance in South Africa. The Kader Asmal Fellowship Programme started in 2013 and each year up to 16 students travelled to Ireland to pursue master's level studies in the areas of business management, food science, agriculture and nutrition, international development and public administration. And as Lawson has said, we work very closely with the Department of Higher Education and Training and the Cannon Collins <coughs> Institute to make sure that the types of courses that are being offered as part of the scholarship program are relevant to the skills and capacity needs of South Africa. And we insist that when the, the young students pass those programs, they come back to South Africa to uh, use those skills uh, in, in the development needs of uh, South Africa. We have recently finalized our awards for 2019 to 2020 academic year. And I am delighted this evening to announce that another 16 students will travel to Ireland to study in various disciplines. They will go in September, October this year. Now, after all of those years, we have about 60 graduates uh, from that program, and we've set up an alumni organization. So when these students went to Ireland as ambassadors of South Africa, they have now returned to South Africa as ambassadors of Ireland. So we developed a mutual relationship on that basis. They are fantastic young people. On the Constitution, as I said earlier, the South African Constitution and Bill of Rights are recognized globally among the best. Of course, that's not to say that changes sometimes may be required, as clarifications of the law are sought and questions are asked about what is constitutional and what is unconstitutional. And that seems to be an ongoing debate in the South African system about is this in line with the Constitution, is it not in line with the Constitution? And it's also, as societies evolve, there might be changes in thinking around particular issues. So I know from our own experience in Ireland, there's constant debate around the values in our own constitution and whether change is necessary as a, as a result of the way societies evolve or as, as a result of uh, different interpretations from the constitution or Supreme Courts. In Ireland, we set up a system of citizens' assemblies to provide for a forum on broad discussions on many different issues, such as marriage equality, abortion rights, right to vote, role of women in the home, and many other issues. And I think Irish people have found th this way of working a fantastic way of bringing in a very broad perspective from across the nation of what our constitution means now, uh, are the values that we now have in our country still represented by the Constitution and whether changes are necessary. And a lot of proposals for change have come as a result of that uh, interactive approach uh, involving all of our citizens. And a lot of those recommendations have already been accepted by our government and indeed by the people in referenda because in Ireland we don't accept changes in the Constitution without, without a vote of the people. The people vote in for changes in the Constitution. So for me, I'm absolutely delighted to be here this evening 
and to have the new National Director of Public Prosecutions talk to us about the criminal justice system and the protection of human rights. And it, it seems it's a very hot topic uh, these days, so I'm really interested to hear what the uh, new National Director has to say. I'm also delighted, as Lawson has said, that I get this opportunity this evening, a few weeks before I leave South Africa after five fantastic years. It's an amazing country, this. I've so much enjoyed uh, my five years here in this country and indeed the broader region. Uh, and um, I leave with reg regret that I haven't got longer to spend here. It's, it's, uh, as I say, it's been a blip almost. It's gone so quickly. Um, but this is the nature of diplomacy. We come and we go and somebody else takes over. Uh, but I think Ireland, the relationship between Ireland and South Africa is a very sound relationship. And I've no doubts that it will continue to evolve and develop over the coming years. So thank you very much for the opportunity to come this evening and to again recognise Kader, uh, Asma uh, and Louise uh, as, uh, as Irish people as well as South African and to recognise the contribution they made to uh, human rights law in Ireland. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask uh, uh, Ambassador to hold on for a, a moment because uh, we're now going to uh, present the uh, 2019 Carter Asmal Human Rights Scholarship Award. Uh, this year's recipient is uh, Mr. Fumulani Mbedzi, um, who attained his LLB degree from the University of Venda in 2015. And uh, in the time since then, he's uh, served as a researcher to Chief Justice Mokweng Mokweng and he's now a, le a researcher with the Black Lawyers Association. So I will now call upon Fumulani to come up and receive his award. Getting to the cri critical part of uh, this evening, the, uh, our guest speaker, uh, Advocate Batoy, uh, and I'm now going to call upon um, a former Director General of the Department of Justice, a one-time National Director of Public Prosecutions himself, and now part of a team trying to salvage one of our ailing state-owned companies, Mr. Vusi Piccoli. Good evening, one and all. Normally, I would have introduced Advocate Patoy without looking at my notes. But out of, out of respect of this uh, occasion, I thought I should put it down. Um, I've got a short, pleasant, but daunting task. Um, to introduce somebody who needs no introduction. Where do I start? Let me start by thanking her for allowing me to introduce her. Let me also thank Kasak for giving me this honor of introducing our first female national director of public prosecutions, who started her career as a prosecutor in 1986 in Chatsworth, Durban, to this day, she remains a dedicated and a highly skilled professional prosecutor. A skill that was also sought by the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, where she spent years as the senior legal advisor to the chief prosecutor, almost 10 years. She has the rare but distinguished honor of having been appointed by no less than three different South African presidents post-1994 to different positions of responsibility. She served in the investigation task unit established by President Mandela in 1995, at the time we were having serious violence in KZN. She was appointed KZN DPP by President Mbeki in 2000. 
the first female prosecutor to be bestowed that honor. Now, she has been appointed by President Tumamina Ramaphosa, others call him President Kauleza Ramaphosa, in 2018 as our new National Director of Public Prosecutions. In between, she was assigned other important national tasks which she carried out with distinction. Here I can also mention her role as the evidence leader in the King Commission of Inquiry into match fixing in cricket. We'll all remember Hans Tronier. She was also appointed as the regional head of the Scorpions, the Territory of Special Operations in 2000. And then, of course, appointed as our national director. This is what President Ramaphosa said when he announced her appointment, and I quote, the national director of public prosecutions occupies a vital position in our democracy and makes an essential contribution to upholding the rule of law and ensuring the efficiency and integrity of law enforcement. At this moment in our history, as we address matters that South Africans are most concerned about, such as state capture, corruption, and widespread crime. Our country needs a national prosecuting authority that is above reproach in the performance of its mandate and that enjoys the confidence of the public. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together as I invite Advocate Shamila Patoy, the National Director of Public Prosecutions, to deliver the sixth, the sixth annual Kara Asma Lecture. Thank you very much. Good evening. It's a bit embarrassing to be introduced by your ex-boss, <laughs> for whom I have so much of respect and who was one of the inspirational leaders that I've worked under and from whom I have learned so much. So, Vusi, thank you very much. It's an absolute honor to be introduced by you. Um, I'd also like to congratulate Kumulani. I hope I have your name right. I just heard it once. Congratulations on your, on your achievement, and I know this is going to be an amazing journey for you, and hopefully you're going to come back to South Africa and help us fight the good fight as we move on. And I'd also like to thank Kasak uh, for giving me the honor of presenting to you here at this lecture, um, the sixth lecture in these series, um, in honor, of course, of Professor Kader Asmal. Professor Asmal, as you know, spent his lifetime dedication to freedom, equality, and justice. And these are not only reflected in our Bill of Rights, but they stand as a beacon and constant reminder of the values we all embraced in our transition to democracy. Values that now, unfortunately, seem like a dream, a distant dream in the current context of the issues that our country faces. Professor Asma continues to be held in high regard, and you've heard a lot this evening, internationally for his contribution to the processes that culminated in the adoption of the 1996 Constitution and that serves as an inspiration to all of us. Importantly, he will be remembered for his unwavering integrity. At a time when the culture of integrity in South Africa has been strained to breaking point and the rule of law tarnished almost beyond recognition, I take inspiration from this and thank Kasak, his foundation and others for maintaining his legacy through this lecture series and in other ways that you have kept his values and ideas alive. As we consider today the weighty matters of human rights and criminal justice in our own country, increasingly globally, the rhetoric and actions of world leaders retreat from their human rights obligations or show blatant disregard for them. The rise of nationalist sentiment and the promotion 
of self over the welfare of others reflects a dissent that we cannot allow to go unchecked, notwithstanding our own challenges that we face in South Africa. While our constitution stands as a model for other countries, its promises of a wide range of rights and freedoms have yet to emerge as realities for the vast majority of South African citizens. The right to enjoy a better quality of life, free from fear and victimization, simply does not exist. The institutions responsible for ensuring that citizens are protected and that justice is delivered, including the NPA, are clearly failing the citizens of South Africa. Public confidence in government and criminal justice institutions is at dangerously low levels. And we have a very small window of opportunity to turn the situation around before all credibility is lost. Violent crime, as we all know, probably almost every one of you has been a victim of crime or know someone that has been a victim of crime, is destroying families and communities and unprecedented levels of corruption have ravaged our economy and its current prospects. High levels of inequality contribute to vastly different levels of vulnerability to the problems of crime we face. Yet, we as South Africans, resilient as we are, have no choice but to address these problems head on and with the confidence that we can shift the balance. We must do so in order to meet the most basic constitutional obligations that we have, to uphold the rule of law and safeguard fundamental freedoms. Let me dwell just a little bit on the extent to which some of the challenges we face with regard particularly to corruption and violent crime. As you all know, corruption has become so widespread that there's a real danger of it becoming entrenched and normalized in South Africa, unless something serious doesn't happen soon. For too long, corrupt politicians, government employees, and business leaders have acted almost with impunity to plunder the scarce resources of our country. They have done so in plain sight and in the most brazen ways imaginable. You may know that it's been estimated, well, it's been reported that almost one third of the GDP of South Africa has been lost to corruption. And a large percentage of that already left the shores, have al has already left the shores of South Africa. Money that would have gone to development, to provision of basic infrastructure for the poorest and most vulnerable parts of our societies. Water, sanitation, um, in basic infrastructure, electricity, housing. In 2019, the Global Corruption Barometer noted that 64% of respondents believe that corruption has increased in the previous 12 months. You will remember that Professor Asmal spoke and acted courageously against corruption. For him, the needs of the people were betrayed too easily through self-aggrandizement and, self and corruption. What would he say if he were here today? In 2008, he resigned from Parliament rather than be obliged to vote for the constitutionally questionable dissolution of the ex-director of the Director of Special Operations, the so-called Scorpions, which was tasked to deal with corruption at the time, and which I had the absolute pleasure and honor to be serving in uh, during that time. It is clear that corruption disables the ability of our government to deliver basic services, as I said and in doing so, violates the human rights of the most vulnerable of our citizens. Only a clean and honest private and public sector where greed is not allowed to thrive can guarantee us sustained economic growth that creates decent jobs for people. Our constitutional court has recognized that corruption threatens to fell at the knees virtually everything we hold dear and precious in our hard-won constitutional order. In relation to violent crime, as South African citizens go about our daily lives, we do so with a heightened vigilance to violence and crime.
these constant feelings of insecurity, which have been extensively reported on in research and in the media, are simply unacceptable as the new normal. The Global Peace Index 2019 ranked South Africa 127th out of 163 countries and districts measured on the list of the most peaceful countries in the world. This is a grim indictment on our beautiful country. Our crime statistics alone, which I remind you reflect only reported crime, show high rates of murder and interpersonal violence, including against women and children. This reflects our failure to meet our constitutional promises relating to the right to life and rights relating to be free from all forms of violence. Overall, a weak economy, high levels of corruption in both the public and private sector, distrust in government, and poor service delivery are closely associated with social unrest, unrest as are the issues of hate speech and xenophobia. We all know that for victims of crime and violence, the criminal justice system has failed them. It has not been effective enough nor swift enough. You all know this. This is the grim and bleak picture that we face in South Africa today. It is bleak and it is unacceptable. But now let me turn to what I believe is the light at the end of the tunnel. I would not have come back from a very, very peaceful, comfortable life in the Netherlands to South Africa if I didn't believe that there was hope and that we could turn things around. When I was first approached to come to, come to put my name into the hat to be national director, I said no, because I was living a very comfortable life in the Netherlands, enjoying my life uh, in The Hague and working as the legal, senior legal advisor to the prosecutor of the ICC. And anonymity is liberating. And just peace of mind is priceless. And having been with the King Commission, I had some idea of what it meant to be in the public space and to have the media around you. And believe you me, it is the most uncomfortable thing. Having protectors around you that follow you around all the time, your privacy is non-existent almost. And so there was I, enjoying a really comfortable life. And so I said no. And when I was approached the second time, I thought about it and my son actually spoke to me and he said, mom, you are being selfish. He said, you are thinking about the good life that you have in Europe. I was always gonna come back to South Africa. I went for one year and then it became two years and then it became five years. I was always gonna come back, but of late when I was asked, are you gonna come back? I said, yes, but never to the NPA. And so when my son said to me, he said, mom, you have an obligation to your country. He said, and I realized when I thought about it, it's true. I, I don't have a choice in this matter. And I say this because, I mean, it just goes against the grain because I've always brought my sons up to say, you always have a choice and you'd better be ready for the consequences. But in this case, I really felt I owed it to my country to come back. And one might think, okay, so fine, it's not gonna be, you're gonna be giving up. <laughs> Thank you. You're gonna be giving up peace of my, your peace of mind, you're gonna be giving up your privacy, you're gonna be giving up you know, all of these things. At least you might get paid more, but I don't. So, <laughs> so anyway, but the point of all of this is, I realize you can't stand on the sidelines and shout. You have to jump in there and do what you can. I mean, when I was interviewed, I said, you know, it's, it's like jumping into a shark tank. And so, you know, I, the sharks are swimming around. I know there will be attacks at some point. So, you know, there, there's no, there's no, I have no regrets at this point having come back. I find that there's purpose in my life now. You don't just wake up every day and go to work. You wake up because you know you have an opportunity to make a difference. Not alone, that sounds too arrogant. It's not me, I can't do anything on my own. We need a whole lot of committed people that can work together. At the moment in the NPA, all that's happened is they put a national director on the top and nothing else has changed. Well, Advocate Cronier has now been appointed as well, but a lot has to change. And I'll talk about some of those things in a minute. There's no qu question that the solutions are complicated and it will be not easy. It will be neither easy nor quick, but then nothing worth it ever is. As you know, I took office in February this year as the NDPP. And I'm deeply honored to be the first head of the NPA that was selected through a transparent 
and consultative and public process. As a firm believer in upholding both the spirit and the letter of the Constitution, this, in my view, sets a very important precedent for future appointments, not only for the appointment of future NDPPs, but also for heads of other important independent institutions in South Africa. For almost 10 years of working abroad, sorry, after 10 years of almost, after almost 10 years of working abroad, I returned to a divided and weakened NPA and a criminal justice system almost in total disarray. The depth of challenges that confront us both in the NPA and in the criminal justice broader system are very serious. In the NPA, they are well known. Instability in leadership, serious allegations of impropriety and even capture against some of the leaders, an exodus of skilled staff, a virtual end to professional develop development and training programs. Notwithstanding many hardworking and dedicated prosecutors working under extremely difficult conditions, years of instability and loss of confidence in leadership, undue political influence and corruption have led to an inertia in the institutional frameworks of the organization and a serious problem relating to staff morale. Challenges in the broader, and that is just within the NPA, there are huge challenges within the broader criminal justice system. As you know, you may have heard General Labia of the Hawks speaking about the drain of skills from the DPCI and the fact that he also has an establishment of around 4,000 or so and that he has serious shortage of skills. I think he's got about 1,500 out of a, a potential, um, a full complement of about 4,000. So besides the fact that you have s vacancies, you also don't have skills. If you add to that corruption, demotivation, people that just simply don't do the work they should be doing, the skills in government and in law enforcement is extremely low. Since my appointment, I have embarked on a series of efforts together with NPA colleagues, government partner, partners, those in civil society to revitalize the NPA, including its role in strengthening the criminal justice system as a whole. We continue these efforts in the knowledge that the task of restoring public confidence in the NPA, which sits at the center of the criminal justice system, as I said, will not be easy. I have often lamented to colleagues, and now probably to their annoyance, that nothing seems to have, been, to have changed since the 10 years that I left. I said I left 10 years ago and I've come back, and now it seems like time stood still. We have the same problems in the justice system. Much has been done in the 10 years to better integrate and to improve the functioning of the criminal justice system, but he has not achieved the desirable results. And I ask myself, how now can our efforts, can my efforts together with the efforts of a whole lot of people change things? Well, the next chapter of the NPA's history requires a new vision, new energy, and new leadership. I must say that the appointment of a young Minister of Justice is most encouraging. During my first briefing to the NPA staff in February, I said that I thought I had an understanding of the gravity of the challenges and the nature of the corruption threats that we face. I reminded prosecutors that morning that we are lawyers for the people and that the people don't trust us. The people don't trust their own lawyers. I committed to them that we will together turn this around. I have been mindful in our efforts that we need to focus on learning from previous efforts through listening and understanding the needs of my staff and those that we, stir, that we serve. Getting this right has many components, but there are four key pillars. There are four key pillars to my vision for the NPA. And what I've very pleasantly realized, is not just my vision, it is a vision of most of the very dedicated prosecutors that are in the NPA. And they are independence, professionalism, accountability, and credibility. Independence. We need a deep commitment to our constitutional obligations and an unwavering commitment to our independence. As I've said before, when I first met with President Ramaphosa, I said to him, Mr. President, I know the Constitution guarantees the independence of the NPA, but we know what has happened in the recent times. And I said to him, I want you sitting across from me to give me your word 
that there will be no interference in the work of the NPA. And, I, and he unwaveringly said, there will be no interference. And up until this day, there has been absolutely no interference in the executive, uh, from the executive on the work of the NPA. This is a commitment from the president that I will not waver from enforcing at any cost. We are also exploring options on how to further strengthen the, N the independence of the NPA and the office of the NDPP. Professionalism. Effective independence means that we need to get our own house in order first. We need to be a professional organization with the capacity to deliver. Together, my staff, we will work tirelessly with our government counterparts, external partners, including civil society organizations and the private sector to ensure that the NPA evolves into a cutting edge organization that can address the challenges facing prosecutors in the 21st century and facing the country in the 21st century. This will require very hard work, innovation, lots of innovation and perseverance. Prosecutorial accountability is a recognition that the prosecution services derive their powers from the state, which in turn derives its powers from the people. In a democracy, the principle of accountability holds that state officials are responsible to the citizens for their decisions and actions. And the NPA must also, we, I, that any national director must be held, must be transparent about and must be held accountable for the decisions we make. Decisions to prosecute and decisions not to prosecute. The concept of accountability is central to the idea of democratic governance based on the rule of law. The NPA, as I said, must account for our actions. Prosecutors have a lot of power. Also the power to disrupt lives and impact on the rights of citizens. We need to exercise this power responsibly and not abuse it and within the framework provided for by the law and the constitution. Credibility, as you know, the credibility of the NPA has taken a serious knock over the, the recent times. And we will, I'm confident, be able to restore credibility and to deliver the effective service that we need to because of the commitment of the prosecutors that remain within the NPA. I've often said that in order to be a credible prosecuting authority, it's pointless me standing here and saying to you, I am independent, I am fearless, I'm, you know, the Constitution guarantees I have a duty, etc., etc. We must, by our actions, you must be able to say, look at that independent NPA. Look at the decisions that they've taken. That demonstrates that is a truly independent and credible uh, national prosecuting authority. The NPA is responsible for bringing justice to the victims of crime, fundamental to achieving the human rights objectives in our constitution. Yes, indeed, we need to always prosecute without fear, favor, or prejudice, while maintaining a victim-centric approach. Our current efforts will need to be vastly improved in this regard in order to better serve the people of South Africa. Ensuring that we are able to understand the needs and concerns of our public, we are also trying to ramp up efforts to establish the office, an Office of Complaints and Ethics in the office of the NDPP to deal more effectively with corruption-related allegations against members of the NPA. This is, also provide, is already provided for in the NPA Act. Many of you may, all, well, all, all of you are certainly aware of the establishment of the, of the direct investigating directorate um, that was announced by President Ramaphosa in March this year. This directorate will, however, deal with one small aspect of corruption. The rest of the NPA, which is seriously understaffed and under-resourced at the moment, will have to still deal with a large percentage of the corruption that has ravaged our country. In addition, asset forfeiture also plays an important role in the fight against corruption. I'm glad I saw uh, Commissioner Kieswetter was here. We've also, together with SARS, been looking. We realize that if we want to deal properly with corruption, we need to have a multi-pronged strategy. I know people are waiting for action. People want to see, so many people say to me, we want to see people in orange overalls. What they don't realize is that it will happen, but when we do it, we must make sure we get it right. Because those that are arrested, those that will be arrested, 
will certainly hire the most competent silks. Maybe your firm of attorneys might be also hired to defend them. People that will pay a lot of money to and make lots of lawyers very rich in fighting these cases. When we d and the, the strategy often is not to not to deal with the merits of the case, but to fight everything outside of that. Deal with the processes. You fight the processes, you fight the people, and you need to make sure that that is done to the T. And people also don't realize that it's not like the criminal justice system has been working so efficiently over the years that now that you have a new national director, the cases are just ready to take to court. You must understand that for years, there was a deliberate attempt not to ensure that these cases were not investigated. There was nothing happening in these cases. And now that everyone's hearing about these things in all of the commissions, the public commissions, they think, why is the NPA not doing anything? When are people going to be arrested? People will be arrested. And I think people do want to also see that the wheels of justice are turning. And we recognize that more than anything, that we have to start, even if it means you start with certain lower levels, you're not gonna go to the big fish immediately. And I'm not saying this is a strategy, but we need to show people that the wheels of justice are turning, and that will happen. But it's gotta be a multi-pronged strategy. So for example, working with SARS to look at income tax related contraventions, asset forfeiture, hugely important. Because it's not just about putting people into prison, it's about bringing back the money. As I said, it is an insane amount of money that has been stolen by corruption. And we need to ensure then in addition to holding people accountable, we bring back the money. So asset forfeiture, which in the NPA has got more than a 25% vacancy rate, is a very, very important of the strategy to deal with corruption. We are also currently trying to work on to develop additional strategies to improve the performance of the NPA. I'm, I'm just gonna touch very, very, you know, uh, likely on this, the performance of the NPA is really very good because if you look at conviction rates, the prosecutor is about 80%, 70% in the regional courts, n almost 90% in the high courts. So one might say, so what's the problem? You know, we have prosecutors are doing really well. We have really high conviction rates. And on the other hand, the police, for example, say, they, they measure themselves by way of arrests. and They have fantastic measures to say, so the police are doing extremely well, the prosecutors are doing really well, and crime, we're making no impact on crime. So we have to rethink, what are the measures? How do we measure ourselves so that we know we are making an impact on crime? I've talked to the National Commissioner as well about us looking at having joint measures. So the police and the prosecutor have joint strategies and joint measures in order to deal with these issues. As I said, the next chapter of the NPA's history requires a new vision, a new energy. We are setting up a strategic support and innovation capacity in the office of the NDPP. We will design it so that it's able to be in touch with best international good practices, sorry, with international good practices, that we're able to anticipate new challenges, and we're able to be innovative. There's something, there's no innovation in the system. And that is why I say we need young people now to come, to come up with new ideas about how we can start making the criminal justice system more effective. Um, in addition to that, I think I'm going to wrap up because we have a, we have a few minutes for, for questions. So I want to say that we need so much more from not just the NPA, but from our government partners, from yourself as civil society. We need to have partnerships with business and media. If we want to have even a small chance of achieving the president's target of a reduction of crime by 50% in 10 years, departments of justice, health, education, social development, sport, all need to work together, together with civil society, in order to ensure that we, we don't only have reactive, we don't only react to crime, but that our prevention efforts are rewarding us in the process. I want to also acknowledge the role of civil society. We have hugely benefited in, in South Africa from your efforts to expose misconduct in government and in the private sector. Litigations by civil society organizations and others have played an important role in our collective efforts to protect democracy and human rights, and in the process has generated an impressive body of jurisprudence. We owe a debt of gratitude to those of you that have done this. We expect that such civil society organizations 
will continue, that those that work in the space of accountability will continue with your critical work, including holding the NPA and myself as NDPP to account for our actions. Equally, civil society has played a critical role in ass assisting the NPA to do its more work more effectively, and I hope that we will be able to continue with that good re relationship. And hopefully, you will also protect the NPA when it will start come under attack in hopefully the not too distant future. As long as we in the NPA fiercely respect the rule of law and do not violate the values enshrined in the Constitution. If we do, then you've got every right to take us to court. The nature and extent of crime, including corruption in South Africa, and its impact is evident everywhere. It affects the rights of citizens, ordinary citizens, every day. In order to, in everything that we do, our aim to er eradicate corruption, sorry, to eradicate crime, including corruption, has got to be a concerted, coordinated effort if we want to have any chance of turning our country around. We need to work together, government and outside of government, in order to do this without, of course, encroaching on the independence of the NPA. Collectively, we hold the future of our country in our hands. All South Africans are watching and hoping that we can return to a place where justice matters, where victims receive justice, and in particular, what most South Africans want to see is that the rich and powerful are held to account. The people of our country are tired, understandably, and they deserve nothing less. The NPA has a vital role to play in the struggle. Together with the judiciary, it is tasked with the defense of the ideals and values enshrined in our constitution. The yardstick of our development as a nation is the devotion to these ideals by organs and arms of state and to all who serve in them, including the NPA. I am confident it's not going to be easy, but the NPA will return to being an institution that South Africans will once again be proud of, a trusted and credible institution that puts the rights and interests of victims first, that up upholds fair trial rights, and, that one, and one that is not influenced by political pressure or illicit financial gain. But you can forget about all this that I say. All I want to say is watch us and judge us by our actions. We know that the challenges are immense. But as I've said previously, let us not succumb to despair that the challenges we face are insurmountable. Challenges have always existed, and they will continue to do so. It is in the meeting of these challenges that we fashion ourselves as a nation. I know it won't be easy, but I'm sure that with the support of all good people wanting to fight the good fight, that in five years to come, hopefully not more than that, we can look back and say, we won the fight against crime and corruption. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shamila, uh, for that uh, inspiring speech, for taking us into your confidence, sharing with us your vision for the NPA in the years to come. I think we can all take a lot of comfort from the words that you've shared with us this evening. Now, as you know, uh, uh, Advocate Batoy has agreed to take a few questions, so I'm going to give uh, an opportunity to uh, just a few questions uh, uh, to her, so please, I don't know if there's a roving mic, but uh, uh, apparently there is one. I see a gentleman here in the front, uh, a lady there, and one at the back. Uh, thank you so much for such a stirring talk. Uh, my name is Mark Oppenheimer from Johannesburg Bar. Uh, you stated earlier that during your absence while you were abroad, the NPA was uh, badly incapacitated, and that a lot of corrupt and criminal people were not prosecuted. Are you able to diagnose what those failings were inside the organization and what steps do you intend to take to remedy that so that it doesn't happen again? In other words, the implication is that the MPA has been complicit uh, in some of the awful things that have happened to our country in the last 10 years. Uh, thank you. My name is Andy Lenomlala. I'm the B Black Management Forum President. 
Shamila, I just want to say you really, really inspire confidence. And one comment I want to make is that our country is on the verge of collapse. And your words and your words alone can go very far in saving it. As BMF, we will be there if you honor the words you've uttered today, that you would remain independent, you will prosecute without fear or favor. We don't see you as the only person that can save our country, but we are very encouraged by the fact that the position you occupy has an opportunity to do a lot more better. Stay strong, we'll support you. Thank you. Thank you. Karima? Um, Advocate Patoy, my name is Karima Brown. I'm a journalist at ENCA. Um, I have two questions for you. Um, you spoke about the fact that you still actually have corrupt elements within the NPA. Now, I want to ask specifically about the redeployment of Advocate Muiponi Noko, that was the head of the NPA in KwaZulu Natal. Uh, she's now been assigned to the North Northwest. Now, if the African National Congress had done that, we would have said they're recycling, um, you know, bad apples. Um, she has uh, a whole lot of accusations against her, particularly in the light of the fact that. Uh, the former Hawks head, General Johan Boysen, has now been found not guilty. Why is she still in the NPA? Why are you tolerating her being there, given the fact that there's ample evidence uh, that she is unfit to actually be a provincial head of the NPA? And then the second question I want to ask is, um, the NPA is generally very hesitant to speak to the media and I can understand that after the Bulalani Nuka uh, statement around having prima facie evidence and deciding not to prosecute, but South Africans are clamoring for being informed um, and wanting to know exactly what progress you are making. How do you strike the balance between conducting proper investigations and not compromising those investigations, but actually allowing South Africans to get an idea of the progress that you are making. Because at the moment, uh, the majority of South Africans believe that you are not making any progress. No one is going to jail, and no money is being returned. Thank you, Julia. I wasn't writing anything, so I hope my memory is not going to fail me. Uh, maybe I'll just then take the last question first. Um, I try to explain, I understand South Africans are, are you know, understandably tired and they want to see things happening. Um, I try to explain in my address why it's important that we get things right. So all I want to say to South Africans that I know their patience has probably run very, very thin and they want to see the wheels of justice turning. You have to appreciate the enormity of the challenges that faces not just the NPA, it's a criminal justice system because you must understand the directorate has only just been pronounced and proclaimed. And so they are starting their work. And people think that, you know, you've had a, the cases that were being properly investigated and it's ready to go, you know, just take it to court. So there's work, there's lots of work to be done to ensure that the cases are absolutely watertight. And that will happen. People talk about low-hanging fruit and those kinds of things. We are looking at a range of cases with lots of each one having their own challenges that I don't want to go into any detail about. But all I want to say is that I, more than anybody, and the new head of the directorate, is acutely of the of where that South Africans want to see action. So all I'm saying is that your patience is going to be tested a little longer, but you will. With regard to communication, that's a tricky one. It's true. I mean, when I took office, and, and my communications, uh, head of communications is somewhere here, you probably know her. Um, it was about trying to strike that balance. And, you know, I've, I'm, I know people want to, it's, you know, she's, she's developed a communication strategy. People want to hear from you, but at the same time, we must speak when we have something to say. And as I say also, you know, people don't want to hear me talk. They want to see action. 
So, you know, the more people hear me, they're going to say, well, it's the same old thing again. You know, we've heard that. When we have something to talk about, we will. And so, but at the same time, we need to strike a balance with responding to certain things that happen. But um, it's part of the strategy is not to talk too much, but for our action to actually speak louder than words. But we're trying to strike that balance. The question about uh, BMF, thank you very much for your support. And, um, you know, it's, there have been support from, from a whole range of different entities. And we need, the country needs that very, very much so that we can move forward. Um, the question about, a very personal que question about a member of staff. I know this, this matter could be broadcast. It's, a, um, it's not a press briefing. I didn't think it was going to be. Um, so I, what I will say is that the transfer was at the staff member's request. And I also want to say that there are processes in government that need to be followed. Um, you require, there must be fairness in the process. There must be fairness to the staff members involved. And there is a process that we will have to look into these issues um, about how to deal with allegations against certain staff members. Um, with regard to the question of, you know, what, what, I hope I remember your question, it was the first one. What caused the problems in the NPA? Or what, how can we make sure that these things don't happen again? Um, <clears throat> a lot of what, the answer to my question is, a lot of it is publicly known. You know, I mean, you've, you've heard in the public about the allegations against various, various people within the NPA. Um, I, th I have to be careful what I say because I think this is being transmitted, uh, you know, live. So I'm, I think I've been very frank about, you know, in, in, in the past about what I found in the NPA when I came there. And let me just say this, you know, you, you, you wonder about sometimes why, why were certain decisions taken? You know, I mean, uh, recently I, I overturned a decision, uh, a very publicly known decision. And you wonder how, what drove certain decision-making processes? And you know, you look at you look at resources in the in the NPA that were devoted to certain projects and not to others. I mean, a case like the Bosasa case had minimalistic resources up until last year, and there were other cases that had lots of deputies involved in them. And you, when you look at those, we realize what the priorities of an institution is when you look at where it puts its resources. And so, you know, I, I'm struggling with this one, as you can see. <laughs> I think um, the question is, as, as an NPA, we, we maybe just forgot that, you know, we, we were, the rule of law is sacrosanct. And so moving forward, I think, as the NPA, we have to not just say we're prosecuting without fear, favor, or prejudice, but that we have to demonstrate in our actions that we do it. Prosecutors, yes, they are, um, you know, you talk, I didn't say prosecute, I mean, I'm not, your, the way you framed your question, there have been allegations of corruption against prosecutors, and, um, and we, those, I've made it clear to, I'm going on regional visits at the moment, in fact, tomorrow I'm in KZN, speaking to prosecutors there, I've been to the Northwest, Free State, Eastern Cape, um, Johannesburg, Pretoria, speaking to prosecutors throughout the country, and making it very clear to them that they should never be tempted because they will be fired. There's no place in the NPA for prosecutors that are corrupt. There are processes and there's got to be fairness in the processes, but at the end of the day, if prosecutors are tempted, they, and that's why we also want to set up the ethics and complaints capacity within the office of the NPA to in fact make sure that these kinds of things never happen in the future or that we can certainly reduce it to, to the minimal. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank Once again, thank you to Advocate Petroy. Um, we're almost at the end, and uh, I have uh, the pleasure of uh, calling upon the Vice Chairperson of uh, CASAC and the, uh, also a newly appointed Press Ombudsman, uh, Pippa Green, to come and give us a few closing remarks. Pippa. Thank you, Lawson. Um, this is, I think, my last month as Deputy Chair because of my press ombudsman's job. But <clears throat> I want to say thank you very much, Advocate Patoy, and to ENS Africa for hosting this. 
I think that you've spoken words which, um, which really the people are wanting to hear in this country. The, the, your, your emphasis on accountability and transparency in particular are really critical for, for an audience which is not only amongst us but, but, but further afield and the whole public. And I think that you've embodied the spirit of what CASAC and, and particularly Lawson have been, have been campaigning for for these past five years, to look for exactly those, those values, uh, to try and stem the tide of corruption and to try and fix the important things that we need to, we need to fix in the economy, poverty, unemployment and inequality, all of which have been made infinitely worse by the problems that you've, that you've identified. So thank you very, very much once again. We really do appreciate your presence here and are honored by it. Thank you. And then finally, just to uh, once again thank uh, Professor Katz and ENS Africa for their hospitality this evening. Uh, I also need to thank CASAC sponsors and funders, uh, the Yellowwoods Foundation, the Oppenheimer Memorial Trust, and uh, the Millennium Trust. And uh, like many uh, civil society organizations in this room, uh, funding is, is a, a perennial challenge for all of us, be, seeming to become more and more difficult. So we would urge that those of you in this room that can assist us in any way, that you do put your hands up and come forward and try and do that so we can continue to do the work that we try to do. Thank you all very much and we'll see you outside.